Hi there, and thanks so much for joining me for this video. This is the third video in Module 11, where I've been talking about our last two statistical tests of the semester. So in my last videos, I was talking about an independent t-test. Uh, and in these next two videos, I'm going to be talking about dependent t-tests or paired t-tests as they're sometimes called. So with an independent t-test, we are comparing two different groups of people on some continuous variable at the same point in time, right? So we might have uh, 20 males and 20 females uh, take a, a personality inventory at the same time to determine whether they are introverts or extroverts, right? That's an independent samples t-test. But with a dependent samples t-test, instead of comparing two different groups of people at the same point in time, instead, we are comparing the same group of people at two different points in time, right? So if you guys are familiar with uh, for example, longitudinal studies, right? So longitudinal studies might uh, follow a group of uh, kids from the time they are uh, infants and maybe, um, so they might administer some kind of test when they're infants and then administer the same kind of test when they're six months old, right? So essentially what they're looking for is change between time one and time two in the same person, right? So they're comparing scores when the child was an infant to scores when they're six years old, right? So that's essentially what we're doing with a dependent t-test, right? So as I said, in an independent t-test, we're comparing two different groups of people measured at the same time on the same continuous variable, right? So for example, group one or group A might receive a treatment and group B receives no treatment and we compare their scores, right? So maybe people in group A get an antidepressant, people in group B get a placebo, um, and then we compare their scores on some kind of depression inventory. That's the independent t when we would use, that's an example of the kind of experiment where we would use an independent t-test. With a dependent t-test or a paired t-test, we compare the same group of people measured at two different times on the same continuous variable, right? So using the same example of a study investigating depression, okay, we measure group A before and after they get treatment to see if or how their scores might have changed, right? So we only have one group, in this case group A, and we compare their depression inventory scores both before and after they receive some kind of treatment. Right? And in fact, this is more ethical than the previous study I showed you, right? And can you think for a second about why this type of design might be more ethical than the previous one? Well, in the previous example, right? There were some people that got the drug while other people didn't get the drug, right? And suppose your drug is really, really effective at treating depression, particularly among people who might be a danger to themselves as a result of their depression, right? People who are highly suicidal, for example, right? So it's not really ethical if you know the drug is working to give one group of people access to this potentially life-saving drug and not other people, right? But you still obviously want to evaluate whether people's depression score is influenced by your drug, right? 
So this allows you to essentially have the same person uh, simultaneously provide both control and experimental data, right? So the control is their score uh, before the treatment and the experimental is after the treatment, right? So with a dependent t-test, you would still have uh, you would still have two different scores, okay? Um, but they would be with the same person at different points in time. Okay, so you would compare, say the person had a cumulative score of a depression score of 70 prior to treatment, and then after treatment, they had a 52, right? Well, certainly those means, uh, the, the mean depression score after treatment is much lower than the mean depression score before treatment, but you would want to conduct a dependent sample t-test to make sure that that difference between that 70 and 52 reflects a true difference and not something that occurred due to random chance, right? So that's what we're trying to figure out when we conduct a dependent t-test. Okay, so like I said, um, there are a lot of, of advantages of a dependent t-test. On the one hand, um, you're able to give uh, people access to uh, treatment rather than having two different groups, a placebo group and a treatment group. Everybody in your study gets the treatment. Okay. Um, another advantage is that um, um, you eliminate potential pre-existing differences, right? So we try to get rid of pre-existing differences um, by doing things like random assignment. Right? But there still might be uh, something important that differs between um, participants in the placebo group and participants not in the placebo group. Right? Um, so by comparing uh, uh, each of our participants essentially to themselves, we eliminate any potential for pre-existing differences because, again, we're doing not a between subjects test, but a within subjects test, right? So a, so a between subjects test, uh, like the independent t-test, is comparing across or between subjects, whereas a within subject, we're comparing the same subject um, at different points in time, right? So when might we use a dependent t-test? What are some examples of when this type of test might be appropriate? Well, like I said, if we're conducting any kind of developmental research um, and conducting a longitudinal study, right? So for example, if we were interested in um, uh, comparing children's math performance um, when they were in third grade versus when they were in fourth grade, right? We have the same children and we're taking one measurement when they're eight years old and another measurement when they're nine years old, right? Similarly, if we're interested in whether or not uh, substance abuse increases in the transition between high school and college, we would uh, take an assessment of alcohol and substance abuse during high school and then for the same individual, we would conduct a similar assessment in college, right? We could also compare, like I said, the same group of people before and after um, some treatment has been administered, and this is often referred to as a pre-post design. So one of the examples I gave before was uh, students uh, wanting to evaluate the efficacy of uh, an SAT prep course, right? So before we had two different groups of students, one that took the SAT prep course and one that didn't. We could also do a within subjects or a dependent uh, within subjects experiment where we would use a dependent t-test. Um, where we took the same group of people and we had them take a practice SAT test before the course and another one after to see if their scores improved. Uh, and similarly, uh, a lot of uh, psychopathology research is you, uh, we use a dependent or within subjects um, uh, design. 
So for example, if we wanted to look at the impact of psychoactive drugs on reducing symptoms of anxiety or depression, we would again take an anxiety or depression um, inventory before and after um, treatment to see if the score goes down or if symptoms improve, okay? So again, just like uh, the independent t-test, with the dependent t-test, we have one categorical independent variable with two levels, okay? And in this case, our two levels of our independent variable are um, time one and time two, right? So for the first example, uh, our levels would be third grade versus fourth grade. For our second example, it would be high school and college. For our third example, it would be before and after SAT prep or before and after uh, administering the drug, okay? So we have one categorical variable with two levels, time one and time two, and one continuous variable, dependent variable, okay? So really, again, the only difference between the dependent and independent tests is whether we are comparing two different groups of people at the same time or the same group of people at different points in time. So again, the, uh, the design that we typically employ for the independent samples t-test uh, is a between subjects design because we're comparing across or between different participants. Whereas when we use a dependent t-test, we're employing a within subjects design because we're looking for a difference or we're looking for a change uh, within uh, the same participant or subject. Okay, so now that we've talked about uh, generally what a dependent test is and what the objective um, of an independent t or dependent t-test is, um, let's talk about the formula, okay? So this formula is much less intimidating than the independent uh, t-test, um, and it's very, very similar to both the independent t-test and especially uh, the one-sample t-test. So just like both of those t-tests, at the top of our fraction, we are examining the difference between our scores, okay? So in this case, this would be the difference between our pre and post scores, okay? So this would be, for example, the mean of uh, reading performance or whatever it was in third grade and the mean of reading performance in fourth grade. It would be the mean depression score before treatment minus the mean depression score after treatment, okay? So we're looking at the observed mean differences this time between um, the mean that we obtain before and after, or the means that we obtain at time one minus the mean we obtain at time two, okay? So that's what, another way of saying that is we're looking at the mean difference. So we're taking the mean we obtain at time one and subtracting the mean we obtain at time two, or we're looking at a difference, the difference between those two means, okay? And at the bottom, we have our standard error of that mean difference, okay? So again, with the standard error, all that we're doing is we're taking um, the standard deviation of the difference between the mean at time one and the mean at time two, and we're dividing it by the square root of the sample size. Okay, so this is essentially the exact same formula as the one sample t. The only difference is our observed mean difference at, at the top. Instead of subtracting the population mean from the sample mean, we're subtracting the mean at time two from the mean at time one. Okay, so let's look at an example. Okay, 
So let's say hypothetically that nine people are trying a new diet. Before starting their diet, their weights are shown here. So 230, 265, 185, 160, 210, 300, 220, 175, and 255. Okay, so the, the uh, weights that we obtain prior to the diet, those are the scores at time one. And six weeks after starting the diet, right, those weights are the scores at time two, okay? So essentially what we're trying to determine is, is there a significant change in their weight over time, okay? So our independent variable is diet, okay? And it's again categorical with two levels. And our levels are the pre-diet or time one scores and the post-diet or time two scores. And our dependent variable is weight in pounds, which is a continuous variable that lies again on a ratio scale, okay? So again, our null hypothesis is going to be that there is no difference in the scores obtained at time one and the scores obtained at time two. Or another way of saying that for this specific example is that the diet is going to cause no change in, their, in the participant's weight over time. Whereas the research hypothesis is that the diet will decrease their weight over time. And again, because we're positing that the scores will change in a specific direction, this is a directional hypothesis, which means we will uh, conduct a one-tailed dependent t-test when it's time to look at our critical value table. All right. All right. So now we are ready to, uh, to calculate our um, our T statistic. So I have put uh, the um, pre-diet scores and the post-diet scores in a table. And I also have a very important column uh, which lists the difference between the mean at time one and the mean at time two for each participant, right? So for the first participant, their initial weight was 230, and their post-diet weight after six weeks was 219. So the difference column is just the, literally the difference between those two means, and that's negative 11, right? If you go down the table for each of the participants, you'll see, uh, again, 265 uh, for a, a pre-diet weight of, of 265 and a post-diet weight of 260, the difference is 5, and so on. Okay, so those are our first steps, right, uh, is to um, make a table that has the time 1 scores and the time 2 scores, or the pre and post scores, and then we're going to calculate the mean difference for each person. Okay, but we have one more step, right? So if we look at the formula, we still need the mean of the pre-diet scores or the mean at time one um, and the mean at time two. And we need the, um, we need the standard error. And how do we calculate the standard error? Well, the standard error is the standard deviation divided by the square root of n, okay? So in order to uh, calculate all that we need to calculate for the dependent t-test, you're going to need to find the mean and standard deviation of the different scores, okay? So your first step is going to be to look at that third column and add them all up and divide by 9, and that will give you your mean of the different scores, which you'll need for the, for the top part of our T calculation, okay? And then you're going to need the standard deviation. 
right? Well, how did we calculate the standard deviation? If you think back to uh, our, uh, our uh, lectures on variability, right? What we would do is we, we would create a table. So in our table, we had in the first column, we had X, and then we had X minus the sample mean uh, for each of our scores in our sample. And then we squared X minus the mean. And then finally, we did X minus the mean squared over the number of scores in our sample, like minus one. Um, so that's what you're going to do, except your value of X in this case is going to be the different score, okay? So you're going to create a new table, and all of your X values are going to be the mean difference scores. So your X column should be negative 11, negative 5, negative 13, negative 5, negative 6, negative 21, negative 13, 5, and negative 12. Okay? And then you're going to do X minus the mean for each, each score, or each different score, excuse me. Okay? And then, again, the mean is just the mean of, of all the different scores, which is your value of X. Okay? And then you're going to do uh, negative 11 minus the mean of the different score, negative 5 minus the mean of the different score, etc. for X minus M. And then you're going to square the differences, or square X, the X minus M column. Um, and then you're going to use the same formula, right, for uh, standard deviation. Okay? So you're going to do X minus M summed up divided by N minus 1. Okay? So you might want to go back and look at how we calculated the standard deviation, okay? But just remember, your, your x value, when, when you calculate um, the, the mean and standard deviation of the different score, is it going to be the pre-diet score or the post-diet score? It's going to be the different score, right? So uh, if we follow those instructions, right, to find the mean and standard deviation of the different score, you should get m equals negative 9, and the standard deviation is 7.30, okay? So go ahead and try that calculation now. Okay, so feel free to pause the video if you need, um, if you want to work through it before we continue. Um, but once we have the mean and standard deviation of our different scores, um, then we're going to calculate our standard error of the different scores. So that's again going to be the standard deviation, which is 7.30, divided by the, the square root of the sample size, or the square root of 9, because we have 9 participants, and that's going to be 2.43. Okay, and finally, we calculate our t-statistic. Okay. So our t-statistic is going to be the mean of the different scores, which you just calculated, over the standard error of the different scores. So 9 divided by 2.43 is equal to negative 3.70. Okay, so now that we know that our obtained T statistic is negative, negative 3.70, we need to find our critical value. And in order to do that, we need our degrees of freedom. Okay, so for the uh, dependent T test, we find our degrees of freedom just like we did for the one sample. So that's going to be N minus 1. So in this example, we have nine participants. So nine minus one is eight, okay? 
So for eight degrees of freedom, and again, we're gonna focus on that last column because we're doing a one-tailed test. Our degrees of freedom, or excuse me, our critical value is gonna be 1.860, okay? So because, and this is important, because the absolute value of our obtained t, right? So notice that the critical value always says, for t-tests, always says plus or minus, right? So essentially that means that we're using the absolute value of our obtained statistic, not the, not the signed value, okay? So the absolute value of 3.70 is greater than the critical value so again, we're going to reject the null hypothesis, right? But it's important to remember that the fact that T is negative tells us that people's weight decreased over time due to the diet, right? So the sign, whenever we conduct a dependent T test, tells us whether the mean increased over time, that would be a positive value, or it decreased over time, that would be a negative value, okay? So in other words, the diet caused our sample to lose a statistically significant amount of weight after six weeks. All right, so again, when we write this up, we want to state our hypotheses, give our results, um, and uh, include our t statistic, our p value, and our uh, mean and standard deviation for, uh, for each of our groups, right? So we hypothesize that on our diet, participants' weights would decrease, okay? A dependent t test showed that people lost a significant amount of weight over time, okay? And then we report our t value, negative 3.70 are degrees of freedom, and we indicate whether our p-value is greater than or less than 0.05, okay? And then we say, on average, people lost nine pounds um, after being on the diet for six weeks. So again, we've included um, not the mean and standard deviation of the two, of the pre and post, okay? But in this case, for the dependent t-test, we're interested in reporting the difference score, okay? So we include the mean and standard deviation of the difference scores, which you guys calculated um, before um, finding your dependent t-value, okay? So if you all have any questions, feel free to reach out and I look forward to seeing you in my next video.